Welcome back to Harbor Unbox. Today we are taking a look at graphics card performance in Halo Infinite. And we're doing this by testing 30 AMD and NVIDIA GPUs at three resolutions. And we'll also take a look at quality preset scaling. We'll do some image quality comparisons. Then we'll look at stuff like VRAM requirements. So as usual, with these big benchmarks, there is a lot of data to go over. But before we do, today's video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Argent E700 gaming chair. Designed by Studio FA Porsche, the E700 is an ergonomic chair with diverse adjustment options to perfectly support your body. Featuring high quality materials like genuine leather and aluminium, the E700 combines the best of both worlds, gorgeous aesthetics and peak functionality. And it comes in six stunning color options. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so for those of you who missed it, the single player campaign for Halo Infinite was released on December 8th, so just a few days ago now. And with this, we get the eighth main entry into the Halo series with Super Soldier Master Chief back at it once again. For testing, I'm using a demanding section of the campaign as this is very suitable for GPU testing and it's far more consistent than using the multiplayer portion of the game. Speaking of which, the multiplayer portion of the game has been open beta since November 15th and is free to play. So that's very cool and I do wish more games did this. As for the reviews, the game has been extremely well received with 80% positive reviews over on Steam from over 100,000 players who have given their two cents worth. And personally, I've found the single player campaign really enjoyable. It seems to run quite well on modest hardware and I've not run into any bugs or stability issues. So that in itself is a big win for a game these days. It's also available on Steam, so you can avoid the PC Windows store. So that's always nice. As for the game engine, developer 343 Industries is using their own in-house creation called Slipspace Engine. This engine was specifically built or rather modified for Halo Infinite. And I say modified as it's really an updated version of the Blam engine. Still, the updates have afforded the developer more creative and technical liberties when creating the game environments and mechanics. The custom designed engine also enables Halo Infinite to evolve as a platform with new content, mechanics, and stories. It also allows the game's non-linear and sprawling campaign to function with the addition of real-time exterior lighting created by an in-game day-night cycle. Of course, what we want to know though is how well optimized is the game and what will you need to play it at your desired frame rate. As for the test scene, or rather the benchmark pass, I'm using the Outpost Tremonius mission, starting from when the blast door first opens. There's a heap of enemies here and loads of action. And with the difficulty set to benchmark mode, aka easy, I just ran past all the enemies and very rarely were they able to kill me and spoil the benchmark pass. Of course, I'm just too quick. So for testing, we have data from 33 different GPUs at three resolutions, as well as a few extra tests that I mentioned earlier. Once again, I'm also using our Ryzen 9 5950X test system with 32 gigabytes of dual rank, dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory. As for the display drivers, I'm using AMD's Adrenaline 21.12.1 optional, and NVIDIA's GeForce Game Ready Driver 497.09. Okay, let's jump into the data as we do have a lot to go over. Starting with the 1080p data, we find the GeForce GPUs firmly at the top of our graph, with the RTX 3090 beating the 6900 XT by a comfortable 10% margin, while the 3080 was also 10% faster than the 6800 XT. So this one goes in favour of the green team. These high-end GPUs were all good for around 90 FPS or better at 1080p, so it has to be said not amazing performance given the hardware we're using here. That said, previous generation hardware still performed very well. The RTX 2080 Ti, for example, was good for 86 FPS, placing it just ahead of the RX 6800 and 3060 Ti. The 2070 Super was also impressive with 72 FPS on average, and that meant it was 22% faster than the 5700 XT, which is a huge win there, especially given that the 5700 XT has been matching and even beating the more expensive GeForce GPU in a lot of the recently released games. The new 6600 XT was only able to match the previous generation RTX 2060 Super, so another disappointing result there for AMD, and the standard 6600 was slower than the standard 2070. So again, a weak result for the lower end RDNA 2 GPUs, while the first gen RDNA kind of sucked, which is a shame to see, and again, not something we've seen a lot of recently. Having said that, Pascal was also quite weak, with the GTX 1080 Ti only good for 54 FPS on average. And while it was still very playable, that's only RTX 2060 levels of performance. 
Then we find the RX 5700 with just 53 FPS on average, and beyond that we're down in the 40s. So in my opinion, you ideally won't want to go slower than a GTX 1080. And this is because Vega 56 and the GTX 1070 were good for just 40 FPS on average. Then the last playable cards include the 5600 XT and the 8GB version of the 5500 XT. And once again, we have found more evidence that 4GB graphics cards are no longer sufficient, at least not without heavily compromising on the visuals. Then bumping up the resolution of 1440p sees the Ampere-based GPUs pull further ahead as now the RTX 3090, with 90 FPS on average, is seen to be 14% faster than the Radeon RX 6900 XT, while the RTX 3080 is 11% faster than the 6800 XT. The 6800 XT though was good for 75 FPS on average, which made for a great single player experience, but it was only a few frames faster than the vanilla RTX 3070. Again, the Turing-based GPUs did very well in this title, as the RTX 2082 i matched the RTX 3070, and that's a best case result for the previous generation part. Meanwhile, the RX 6800 was only a fraction faster than the 3060 Ti, which was a little bit faster than the 6700 XT. Then with the 6600 XT, we're dropping down to 51 FPS on average, which is about what we got out of a standard RTX 3060. This time, the 5700 XT did manage to match the RTX 2070 and 2060 Super, so a better result here, but still not nearly as impressive as what was seen in other recently released titles. The 5700 XT did manage to edge out the standard RX 6600, as well as the GTX 1080 Ti. Then we have the RX 5700, so the non-XT version, beating the RTX 2060, followed by the GTX 1660 Super, 1660 Ti, and a GTX 1080. Beyond that though, we are dropping down to 30 FPS on average, making parts like Vega 56 and the GTX 1070 unsuitable for these quality settings. And of course, this is also true for anything slower. Finally, we have the 4K data, and this is pretty straightforward. Here, just a few GPUs managed to push over 50 FPS on average. Again, Nvidia dominates the top of our graph with the RTX 3090, 3080 Ti, and 3080, all beating the 6900 XT, while the 6800 XT was good for just 54 FPS on average. Then we see the RTX 3070 Ti dropping down to 50 FPS, closely followed by the RX 6800 and RTX 2080 Ti. Beyond that, we're into the low 40s, and really anything slower than the 6700 XT and RTX 3060 Ti are unacceptable here. Okay, so we've just looked at performance using the highest quality preset, labeled Ultra, but how much extra performance can you squeeze out of these GPUs with the lower quality settings? In the case of the Radeon RX 6900 XT, lowering the quality preset to high boosted frame rates by 11%, so only a very minor improvement. And then from high to medium, we see a further 17% increase, and from medium to low, a massive 44% increase to 176 FPS on average. And similar scaling was also seen with the RTX 3090, which saw a 15% improvement from ultra to high, then 14% from high to medium, and finally 19% from medium to low. So the low preset didn't quite offer the same performance boost that we saw with RDNA 2, but this is probably to be expected with Ampere at 1080p as it doesn't scale quite as well. Then with lower tier products, we found much the same. Vega 56 and the GTX 1080 saw a 15 to 18% increase when going from ultra to high, then a 17 to 20% increase from high to medium, and finally a 26 to 33% increase from medium to low. Now to help put that preset scaling data into perspective, here's a quick look at a visual comparison. Frankly, there really isn't that much difference between these presets, especially when comparing medium, high, and ultra. Low does stand out a bit more with poorer lighting and shadow quality being the big ones, but overall it's quite surprising just how little difference there is between the various presets. And while I know ultra typically only offers uh, very little difference when compared to something like high, the performance difference here wasn't huge. And then the difference between medium and ultra is very minimal and Let's take a closer look at that. There are some differences. For example, shadow detailing and quality is a bit higher. Uh, textures are slightly more detailed, especially distant textures. But really, these differences are very subtle. And then in my opinion, the difference for indoor environments with small draw distances is even less obvious. And frankly, I just play using medium. And then here's a look at VRAM usage for the section of the game tested. And please note, 
testing VRAM usage is quite difficult, especially to do so accurately, as different sections of the game will require different amounts of memory. So chances are the demands will be even higher in other parts of the game, and of course lower in other sections. For 1080p, you really want a minimum of 6GB when using the ultra quality preset, and we certainly saw evidence of this with the 4GB graphics cards, which suffered very badly. Then at 1440p, you'll ideally want a minimum of 8GB, though parts like the RTX 2060 played okay. For those of you gaming at 4K, VRAM is probably less of a concern, in the sense that most GPUs capable of delivering satisfactory results have more than 8GB of VRAM. So there are a few things worth noting here. Firstly, let's talk about the quality presets. Normally I try and test with a few different presets across all 30 plus GPUs, but this time I just didn't have the energy, if I'm gonna be honest, didn't have the energy and the time to do that much testing. We're getting near the end of the year, so a lot of things to wrap up, and we'll just have to settle with the ultra quality uh, settings, plus some detailed preset scaling, coupled with the basic image quality comparison. What we found was most of you will just want to play with the medium quality preset enabled and this will boost performance by at least 30% from what's shown here. Both the RTX 3090 and 1600 XT were 30% faster using the medium quality preset opposed to Ultra, while the GTX 1080 and Vega 56 were both 38% faster. So for those of you with older GPUs, that was the difference between around 40 FPS on average at 1080p to more like 55 FPS, and that makes a big difference to how well this game plays. On that note, as Tim has explained multiple times in the past, we're not really doing those graphic optimization guides anymore. I know a lot of you want to see them, so it is a bit disappointing, but they take heaps of work and Tim just isn't interested in doing them anymore. And he's also not interested in doing them because most of the time it's just like, use medium quality settings, which is certainly the case with Halo. So if you want an optimization guide, use the medium quality preset and maybe play around tuning the other settings, but really medium is probably what you're gonna to wanna to use. And another noteworthy mention is async compute. And this can be found towards the bottom of the video menu. And I'm not sure why, but for whatever reason, this option is disabled by default. All modern GPUs now support async compute, and I found enabling it did boost frame rates by five to 10%, depending on the quality settings and GPU. But for GPUs that support this hardware feature, do make sure you go into this menu and enable it. So for those of you happy to use the medium preset at 1080p and are seeking a 60 FPS experience, this should be possible with something like a GTX 1080, 1660 Ti, 1660 Super, or Radeon RX 5700. For the same performance using Ultra, you'll require a 5700 XT, a RX 6600, RTX 2070, or RTX 3060. So the hardware requirements on PC are quite steep, especially with those ultra quality settings. Unfortunately though, for those of you still clinging to old hardware, such as a Radeon RX 580 or a GeForce GTX 1060, you'll need to use the lowest possible settings for maybe 40 FPS at 1080p. Now, depending on demand, I could do a CPU benchmark, and it does appear as though Halo is very CPU intensive. I actually initially played the campaign for an hour on a Ryzen 5 3600 system, and while performance was generally good, the CPU was constantly maxed out, often hitting 100% load with a high-end GPU. I should also note that while gaming, RAM usage often hovered around 10 gigabytes total. So it should be perfectly playable with 16 gigabytes of RAM, but as always, 32 gigabytes is a nice luxury. And that is going to do it for this look at Halo Infinite. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe for more content. As I said, if you guys want to see a CPU version of this video, then I guess make note of that down in the comment section below and I'll see what I can do. Uh, also, if you'd like to support the hardware directly and get some awesome perks in return, we have Patreon or Floatplane. Sign up to one of those and you'll get stuff like access to our exclusive Discord server, monthly live streams to myself. That's coming up quite shortly. Next few days, next week maybe. Uh, what else? Getting derailed here. Behind the scenes content, Q&As, a lot of cool stuff there. So if you guys are interested, check it out. But if not, that is perfectly fine, and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.